We're going to move on to our next conversation. You could please return to your seat. Welcome back. I realize now that we're alternating between a conversation <laughs> primarily about maps to a conversation primarily about art, what we just did. We're now circling back to primarily maps, but as we've, I think, determined by now, they're not one or the other, both and theme. So our next conversation is between uh, two brilliant minds here at Stanford. We have David Medeiros, who's our geospatial reference and instruction specialist at the uh, Stanford Geospatial Lab at the Branner Earth Sciences Library, um, Stanford Geospatial Center. He is part of a team within Stanford Libraries that provides instruction and support for students and faculty using GIS in their research. His educational background is in geography, both BA and MA. His professional background is split between GIS and cartography. David has been producing maps of one kind or another for the past 20 years. David will be interviewed by Emanuela Luli here who is the Assistant Professor of Art History and Architecture at Stanford. He teaches, researches, and writes about art in late medieval and early modern Italy and France. His theoretical concerns include questions of labor, the history of measurements, mapping, and the reach of cultural networks. He wrote a book about the history of the meter. He edited a volume about scale in art. His new monograph, The Making of Measure and the Promise of Sameness. I love that title. I want to read it again. The Making of Measure and the Promise of Sameness is out next month uh, from University of Chicago Press. It is a history of how measurement standards came about and how they changed perception about space and justice. He is currently writing a book about precision during Leonardo da Vinci's youth. Please welcome our next speakers. Is this on? Hi. Thank you for coming. Thank you, um, everyone. Thank you, Emily um, and, and uh, David and Salim all for putting this on and, um, and allowing me to speak. Um, so as Emily said, I'm the GIS reference and instruction specialist at the Stanford Geospatial Center, that's a mouthful, um, at the Stanford Library. So I spend a lot of my time helping folks at Stanford's uh, students, staff, and faculty learn how to make use of mostly um, GIS tools, geographic information systems tools to do digital mapping for usually research and analysis and, and a little bit of it. Um, more for sort of the cartographic side of things, communication and, and visual display of information, but it's really more about analysis, you know, mapping for analysis. Um, that's my professional life now. Um, I've spent a lot of um, other time as a what I would call a more of a practical publication cartographer, making maps for the maps themselves, making maps um, for communication or as reference devices. So I think I'm kind of here in that capacity right now to talk as a practical cartographer about um, sort of, you know, contemporary construction of maps today and how some of that intersects with, um, with the world of art, whether, you know, in, 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 in either direction. Um, I, I think this will hopefully be a nice free and open discussion about all that stuff, but I'm going to start by reading off my script so that I can make sure I can get to the, uh, the you know, points that I want to get to. And I'm going to, I'll go through these pieces up here one by one and, and give a quick description of um, the how and why of each of these maps and a little bit about what I think about um, where art intersects with them. These are all maps that, uh, and, and on, on an object that I've produced. Um, so the theme for the symposium of maps and art is a perennial one for most cartographers. It is in the standard description of our profession, the art and science of making maps. There is a natural alignment between art and cartography in both methods of production and uh, in many cases the aesthetic value of the work itself. 
cartography has its roots in utility, but the visual communicative nature of, um, of the craft lends itself obviously to artistic influences, both influences into the, the map designs themselves and maybe the influences of the maps outward into art, um, and, and an artistic expression within, within cartography. I own maps as art. Um, I make maps that I treat like art. I hang on the walls and I put up on my mantle. Um, that said, I don't think of myself as an artist. I don't have a strong traditional artistic skill set. Um, instead, I rely on the digital tools I work with day to day and find creative, um, creative ways to use them beyond their intended roles, which I suspect a lot of artists would say they do with their own <laughs> medium. So um, the maps I make usually fall into one of two groups as the byproduct of that GIS work that I do. Um, or in the second group as a creative project, either one that is, um, is done with or for a client or is something that I do for myself. Um, and again, uh, these are a set of, um, of maps on screen that I've done and I'll just kind of go through them quickly and talk about what, why they were made and how they were made a little bit and uh, where the art intersects with them. Uh, if you want a little bit of a snapshot into the mind of a, a visual design thinking person, there are two ways to arrange the images on this screen. One is in the order that I will talk about them. The other is in the order that I thought they looked better in. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about these in any kind of logical order. We're gonna jump around. Um, the map down here at the bottom left is, um, this is the, the western portion of the Columbia River Valley Scenic Highway. It's a trail map. You can't see it from where you are, but there's a lot of detail in here about the trails, the, the lower, um, the the um, southern portion of the, of the Columbia Gorges um, trailheads and the river systems and um, a lot of the scenic waterfalls and that sort of thing. This um, was produced as a, in, in the style of a print map, that's my background, but was made for digital devices. So this would go on a, uh, into an app you'd put on a mobile phone. The idea is um, that you are bringing sort of the quality of a publication level map to that interactivity and the functionality of the Google interface of being able to see yourself on this map, um, but you're not sort of limited to um, what some of the most mobile apps bring in terms of the cartography that they give you, right? So it's kind of like the beauty of a, a publication map with the functionality of a mobile device. Um, there is not, for me, a lot of intersection with art in a, in a map like this, other than the normal visual design that, that I would go through. Um, this is my baseline for kind of bread and butter cartography that I, I would do as a professional. I have a, I, it's here to kind of contrast against the other stuff that I produced. Um, in the middle is something that I made uh, for myself. This is, um, it, it's the, the continents laid out in the Dymaxion, the, the Buckminster Fuller projection rotated on its side and all of the background sort of material taken away. So we've taken all of the graticule away and the, the leaves of the projection are missing. Um, so you don't really see the edges of the projection here. You just get this sort of infinite space and, and the land arranged as, um, as Fuller had envisioned it. Um, this is for me just an appreciation of the form of the projection itself, which I think is a strong component to a lot of art with cartography is just sort of dealing with coordinate systems and projections and how beautiful they can be or how how they can change how we see the world. Um, and so here I just wanted to see, I wanted to, to deal with something very simply in that, in that projection. Um, aesthetically, I thought it, I really wanted to see something that looked inky and reminded me of blueprints that I used to work with um, as a cartographer and uh, doing road cartography years ago. Um, so the intention here is something that would be printed on paper. This is the digital copy. Um, over there is a composite of a bunch of different um, satellite images, infrared images of the lava um, flow from the Kilauea volcano from last year. I think it's like been a year this week around this time, so it's been almost exactly a year. Um, here, I'm not doing a whole lot of design. Honestly, this is really for me um, data as something that's beautiful to look at. And so here, we're, I'm just treating the data as the, the focus of the map giving it an, a, a treatment that I think is visually pleasing and then trying to take the map away from it, provide context, but you're pulling everything else out of there so um, the data stands on its own. This, I think, is, um, it, it stands in as you know, a reminder that data, geographic data can be beautiful if treated properly. Um, there is, there's a trend in visual design right now and geo, 
geographic visual design. Um, data as art, I think if anyone knows of these, uh, Daniel Coe um, produces a bunch of maps with LIDAR data of river, ancient riverbeds in Washington and Oregon river systems. Um, and they're, they're not too different from this. I, mean, uh, I think they're a lot better producing this. Um, but really, he's not, he, what he's doing is just showing you the data, but he's doing it in a way that um, I think reveals how beautiful that information could be. So that's data as art. Um, this, this thing up here in the top left, this is Mount Hood. Um, this is probably some, one of the only pieces I've done other than physical objects that I really think of as like I made something that I wanted to really be a piece of art for myself. This was inspired um, by a piece of art by the, um, the painting I, Nora Ishevet by George Edward Altosal. I don't know if I'm saying that right or not. Um, it's a beautiful painting of some you know, icebergs near a shore. Um, it's full of these really rich, deep colors. I think I have it here, if I can just slide forward. Uh, Celine, do the arrow keys forward. There we go, so this is it up here. Um, I just, it was in my feed one day and I thought, I gotta make a map that looks like that. Um, I just like the colors and so I stole the colors from his painting. Oh, this is a lot of art is theft. Um, stole all the colors and thought I'll use that as my palette and I'm gonna make something that evoked the feeling that I was getting from this, but I wanted to do it with something that I had more ownership of, a piece of terrain that I thought was part of my story. Mount Hood is a little bit to me. Um, so I built this map up to sort of reflect what I was getting from the painting. And so to me, this was art being an inspiration to something I wanted to do, dictating a lot about how I was going to build the map itself, and then me making some kind of representation with that that I wanted to keep um, and then maybe put on my walls as a piece of art. I go back. There we go. Um, and so the last piece down here is not a map at all. Um, a lot of the work that I do, it's harder to see in this one, but it's obvious in that one. A lot of the work I do um, for cartography involves terrain representation. That's probably my leading skill in doing cartography is in, is in finding ways to, to deal with um, showing t terrain. Um, it's a really, uh, it can be a very time consuming process. There's a lot of subjectivity. It's not just a sort of a find a data set that shows you what the terrain looks like, throw some light at it, and you've got shaded relief. Um, if you really want to work at it um, sort of from that, that aesthetic point of view, there's a lot more you can do here. And so I spent a lot of time um, dealing with the representations of terrain. And to me, that's in the virtual sense, it's kind of a virtual sculptural process. Um, and that's kind of led me to wanting to also do terrain in a real sculptural process. Um, I'm not sculpting anything here, but I, I want I like the idea of taking this virtual data and making it physical and making it tangible. And so um, I started printing 3D terrains um, that would clip out of different parts of the world as little plastic 3D models, um, decided that they, those didn't, they just felt flimsy and cheap and I wanted something different and so I started uh, making molds out of them and casting them in cement and other materials. Um, and so those are just sort of translations of real terrain into something physical. Um, the casting in cement is really nice because it, it turns something that's either completely intangible or if it was printed is, is light and feathery into something that has a lot of weight in it. Um, has a very different effect on what you think about the thing that you're holding. In this case, though, um, I wanted to make something that intersected with another art form that I, I play around with, and that's landscape photography. Uh, making maps and photography share a compositional moment when you decide to make a map of a place, when you decide to take a photograph of a place. Um, you that that the very decision to pick a part of some part of the world and describe it in some different way is, is or can be an artistic one. It's a compositional one, um, and and so that's what I wanted to do here. I'm I'm being very selective about what I'm clipping out of the of the landscape. Normally, if I was doing something like this for uh, a model for a real geophysical purpose, I would have shown all of the water. This would go all the way down to the coast, and I would want everyone to see the tops of the mountain peaks. In a photo, I wouldn't treat it like that. I want to see just this, the, the focus on the part of the terrain that I think is interesting, and so I did that here. Um, if, you, uh, if you know anything about um, photography, landscape photography in particular, uh, working with big lenses, 
um, long focal lengths. There's a compressive effect of the lens on the scene. The, f the more you zoom into something, the more compressed the image becomes. Um, everything from the, the, the foreground to the midground to the background starts to get drawn together. And in particular, what happens in the background starts to get drawn up. It gets, it gets really close to all the rest of the elements in the image and becomes effectively taller looking than it is in an image that's wider or at a standard focal length. Uh, so I wanted to do the same thing here. I compressed the information so that it's actually not um, you know, from front to back as far or as deep as it would normally be, and I, and I lifted it, I, I raised the Z values to try to make a model that replicated a photograph in a sense. So this is kind of, to me, a, not really a landscape model, it's a, it's a model of a photograph that I would have taken of this same region. Uh, and this, by the way, is a portion of the Nepali um, coast on the island of Kauai, which is where I'm from. So this, that's sort of the personal relationship to this. Um, so that's my quick and dirty uh, background on all of these different pieces. Um, I think there's probably a lot more to, to say, but I, I think that's all I need to say to, to begin the discussion. If, if we, we could go from there and, and kind of just uh, have some back and forth, I think that's fine. Sure, sounds good. Um, thank you, David. Uh, this is interesting. Um, yeah, I would like to ask you questions about process, but perhaps before you answer, I would like to make a couple of points. I think in general there's um, there's a misunderstanding about what art and cartography mean as terms. You know, when we talk about the art of cartography, we mostly employ the term in the classical and Renaissance meaning, where art from the Latin art really means technique. So the art of cartography is uh, like um, like a series of instructions of how to represent uh, like the territory in uh, particular ways. If you look at um, the older documents we have that speak about art before like 1800 basically, um, they use the term in this sense. Uh, so um, a classical text uh, for Renaissance art is called in Italian Il Libro dell'Arte, the book of art, and that's a manual for how to make paint by mixing pigments with binders, how to make brushes, you know, when is the right time of year to paint in fresco. But if you take a book like the Ars Amatoria by Ovid, that's an epic poem about uh, the technique of making love. So it's an erotic map of, map of love um, of, um, of Rome. It tells you where are you likely to find prostitutes, where you know how to apply makeup, uh, um, you know, um, and it talks about sex positions for like fifty pages. <laughs> so, uh, so that is the traditional meaning of art. But the things that the the has changed over the years. Uh, so, for instance, if you take the romantic notions of art has been developed in opposition to the sciences, including cartography. So everything that is art is something that it's not, um, it cannot be, um, it's not objective. Everything that has something to do with the imaginary, right? Uh, and it's something that expresses the um, creative potential of certain artists, right? So from that point of view, it's very difficult to find connections between uh, art and cartography because art has been designed and redefined exactly in opposition to cartography. And this has been going on and on, and art as a field has been redefined in opposition to design, in opposition to fashion, in opposition to um, a lot of institutions, right? So um, for me, it was very interesting to find out how you were talking about art. So you were talking about art objects, like sort of like the conventional ones, such as paintings, right? But then you're talking also about representational conventions uh, that you're kind of like interested in, uh, the, the both valid for the kind of cartographic objects, such as the grid uh, and so on. But also you find that um, an aesthetic uh, pleasure in looking at some of, of the maps and so on. So maybe just as a first question, I would like to know more about uh, you know, how you approach art, uh, what art usually means for you, because it means so many things to so many different people. Yeah, um, art is subjective, so <laughs> um, understatement. Um, yeah, it, it's, in, in terms of the cartographic, my cartographer's hat on, art to me is a source of, um, I don't wanna say inspiration, because that's kind of, tri it, it's, it's like a, it's a collection of resources, and when you when you when I think about art, I'm often looking at the processes and the materials, um, and the styles and design cues that someone has put into their own art, and I'm instantly thinking about uh, breaking those down 
uh, and how they might serve or how parts of those things might serve this other visual design thing that I do. Um, and I think that in both those disciplines of, of you know, traditional art and, and cartography and other visual design, things, wh what is at the basis of all of this is this visual communication, talking through the thing that you're creating. Um, and art employs all these different methods of dealing with communicating the emotion or the sense that the artist is trying to convey through the piece. And as cartographers, we're using styles and, and, and techniques and materials to do the same thing. Emotion may, may play a, a less important role usually, um, at least in terms of the ideal of an objective map. That's not supposed to be what a map is all about usually. Um, but it's still a communicative piece, and the idea is that you're trying to communicate information and tell a story, um, convey something, and how you arrange all these different components plays a huge role in um, the sense of quality, the, sen the sense of objectivity, the amount of emotion that's there, um, and the connection to the story that the map is supposed to be telling. Uh, so that's kind of what I see when I look at art, is I'm always looking at those little components. Um, I have some friends who are... Um, uh, of practicing artists in, in East Bay, um, and when we'll go to showings, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm the person. I always feel bad because I'm always asking about uh, what kind of brushes are you using, what, and you know, or what's, what, what is this table made of that your thing is on that you are actually showing to all of us, <laughs> and I'm more interested in the foundations to it all. Um, so that's how I see art usually is sort of the construction of it all. Right, and then I think you touch on a very important point, which is also cartography has this kind of li liquid meaning. I mean, it went to represent um, distances, uh, like in the past, and that's kind of like basically the only information you get from like pre-modern maps to uh, represent uh, um, national um, identities of some sort uh, to provide uh, more or less accurate representations of the territory, right? And then it also has developed its own uh, um, codes, uh, you know, certain elements that you can only find, you usually find in maps, such, such as the scale, the grid, uh, certain uh, topographical conventions, and so on. And uh, I'm, I'm fascinated that you, like, in both in your cartographic work, but also in your uh, um, creative work, you um, play with some of these conventions, right? For instance, you pick up for your uh, Mount Hood, like, uh, a palette from a from a painting uh, this regarding the representations uh, and then still you kind of like use the palette to convey elevation and so on uh, can you maybe tell us now about a little bit more about uh, the, um, th this kind of uh, the cartographic code that particularly fascinates you the one uh, that for you is kind of taken for granted but also the one that you deliberately try to manipulate uh, yeah so like i said i really find the terrain representations to be where i engage most directly with with maps, um, I'm I'm always really fascinated by with how we depict the actual landscape and all the different ways you can do it. Um, there's so many different ways to give the sense of elevation in a map, and so I spend a lot of time playing with those elements. Um, that's kind of so what can't be seen at the back of the room is um, the the main form here is the shaded relief. There's a lot going on in the shaded relief. It's not just a simple shaded relief, and then on top of it is those contour lines, which are sort of that scientific convention of a map, right? And there's all these different um, pieces that you can bring into cartography that ha serve all these different purposes. Um, and the way in which you combine them and leave things out and put things in has a big effect on the output. In terms of the um, thinking of those specialized languages within cartography, um, I'd first I'd say it's important to, to note that I'm not uh, I, I'm not sort of like a, I don't know, a classically trained cartographer. Like I taught myself all of this. In, spa in fact, I specifically avoided um, cartography courses when I was in my undergrad as a geographer. I thought I, there's no way I have the um, attention to detail and the patience for what real cartographers do. So I'm going to go learn GIS instead. And then I promptly became a cartographer for a decade and did nothing but make maps and learn. Um, <laughs> but I think that that actually is really helpful because in the world of, I, th I think it's this is kind of disappearing to a great extent now, but I've seen over the past 10 or 20 years this real tension between real cartographers who learned about all these conventions of map making and these different languages that you have to bring to putting on, uh, things you have to put on a map and how you have to talk about the map, and, and people like me who didn't really have any of that fussiness and thought it was fine to do whatever we wanted while still following certain 
um, best practices and rules, and it makes it really easy for me to abandon a lot of that stuff. And I think that that's the most interesting cartography comes from um, stuff that breaks those rules or dispenses with a lot of what was, um, you know, sort of structure for cartography for a long time. Yeah, I mean, that taps into the questions of communication because one of the things that cartography is trying to do is to communicate almost like a diagram, like very clearly a certain information, whereas a lot of tendency in art is actually to go for the opposite effect, to produce vagueness, uh, opacity, you know, or open-endedness. I mean, we've seen just now with Felix gonzalez Torres how, in a certain way, it's anti-cartographic, the project, because uh, it, uh, it leaves things so open that uh, um, the reader can... The, the user can uh, can uh, can do whatever they want with the kind of the kind of artwork, and um, so anyway, I would like you to comment on this, and, and also I'm I'm fascinated by the questions of technique. You know, like uh, what what kind of techniques you're using you using know, in when making your maps and your artworks. One of the reasons why, for instance, um, Italian Renaissance artists uh, were so talented at both cartography and. Uh, art is that they really didn't see any difference between the two. There were forms of uh, representing the world, they were interesting in veracity, truthfulness, uh, but also the tools were exactly the same. So you had to be a cartographer, you had to be good at drawing, uh, and that's exactly what uh, you know the traditional uh, training uh, for a Renaissance artist is, to become good at drawing, and using drawing as a way to do anything in the world from, you know, mapping cities to drawing costumes and so on. And uh, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about how, where do you find the, the connections where somehow your cartographical techniques become useful for you as a, a creative thinker and maybe vice versa? Yeah, um, so uh, to the first part of that, I, I think it's really interesting. The uh, Someone was talking earlier about this. Um, someone asked a question about, um, you know, why the surprise at discovering that a, a certain map was not sort of this literal territory that they'd always thought of, right? That these, the sizes of continents were actually different than the map had been depicted. And, um, um, and if we have the, the ability to make a map completely factual and scientific and carry all the information that it could possibly contain, why aren't we doing that? Is, isn't that the reason that we have maps, right? And I'm maybe reading into this a little bit, but that's a constant conversation within the world of cartography is, um, what are these meant to represent? Um, and the reality is that maps have always been um, abstractions and simplifications and generalizations of the world. Um, they appear to be um, literal, objective, scientific documents of territory, but they're not that at all. Um, some are more objective than others, um, but uh, none of them is a literal snapshot of the territory, obviously. Um, so objectivity and flexibility and representation has always been a part of the cartographer's toolkit. Um, the degree to which you employ it uh, has a lot to do, I suppose, with your background as uh, how you were trained to be a, a cartographer, what your end goals are. Uh, but that's always been part of the foundation of what you can do with maps. Um, and that's the artistic side of maps for me is the free design decision um, uh, thinking part of it. Um, so, I'm sorry. What this this that was that I I picked up on your first sentence and I, I forgot the second. You wanted to know the more about techniques. One. I yeah, think, techniques. Right. What kind of tools that help you to mediate between the two disciplines? Yeah. So, um, the the tools that I use are in fact artists' tools for the most part. Um, I my, my day to day work is is in geospatial, so I I, I use a lot of GIS tools, um, and. Not to say that you can't make art with GIS tools, you can't make beautiful maps with these tools. People do, you can. There are more obstacles, um, I think, in that, in that realm. But I, when I'm making something that I want to be beautiful or have a certain level of visual communication or style, I'm always taking stuff out of those normal day-to-day -day geospatial tools I use, and I'm bringing them into tools that a graphic designer or a digital artist would be used to using Photoshop and Adobe Illustrator and other things like that. Um, and so I don't know if that makes the design process easier. I, I don't know if the tools necessarily play a big role. I happen to be working with tools that a lot of people doing other kinds of visual design and art are using. Um, to make maps, and they're not, they're tools that weren't designed initially to make maps. Um, and I, I think that sort of, you know, I, 
I think that you'd find a lot of people who are doing really interesting things in the contemporary space with maps today, a lot of which to me speaks to really interesting and beautiful representations of geographic data. They're all people who probably weren't trained as real um, cartographers. Um, they're breaking the rules and they're, prob they're finding ways to use other people's tools to, to do their work and I kind of feel like that's what I'm doing. I'm finding other tools to do this mapping work and, and putting my mapping work into those tools or techniques like casting and that sort of stuff. Right. Um, because of the definitions of art are so many, a lot um, of artists, curators and people involved in the art business uh, take great comfort in uh, uh, defining art according to the spaces where they've been exhibited. Uh, so basically artworks are all the objects have been exhibited in museums, galleries, and auction houses, right? Uh, um, where do you exhibit your work? I mean, because so much of, uh, um, again, art depends on the, the venue of exhibition, so. So I, like I said, I'm, I don't see myself as an artist. I make pieces for myself. I, I make stuff for clients, so it, it, you know, it gets exhibited in magazines and books, but. Right. So that's where stuff ends up, right? As a, as a publication, it's going to end up in a place that it's being utilized, usually in a, in a, in a book or in a magazine. Um, uh, I, I do have, um, I, you know, uh, some of this stuff I do put up on my Etsy store, if I can say that, um, and people buy it and print it and put it on their walls. So it's, it's out there. It gets right. out there and gets put. People um, engage with a lot of this kind of stuff. Um, more so this realm of things here, very abstract and simple. Um, uh, and then for me, it's just stuff that I produce because I want to see it, so it ends up on my walls, just printed, or, or I'm making them for other people as a piece of art or a keepsake, and it'll end up on their walls printed. Um, yeah, but none of this stuff ends up in sort of a traditional venue for art, right, in, in terms of the stuff I do, and I think probably for most contemporary cartographers, very little of their work would ever end up in that kind of a venue, which is... Right. It's nonetheless interesting to find out, you know, what kind of venues and how people, you know, engage, find uh, these, uh, this type of objects and how they relate to them exactly because the boundaries between uh, the two disciplines keep being, uh, like, negotiated, uh, yeah. like, fairly quickly. You know, I, there's a, I, I hesitate to put, like, a, a name on any of this stuff, but if you were to look at a lot of the kinds of work that's coming out of younger groups of cartographers today, um, they all, they're all deeply engaged in visual design, but also in, I, I think, have a strong background in, in, in art. And, and um, the stuff that they're making is, is being made for news organizations or print publications or for stories that go online. But, the, but often the maps end up having a life of their own, and they're never going to end up in, uh, on the wall of a, a gallery. But they end up doing the rounds on social media and online and in um, you know um, BuzzFeed and, and Vice and other places. And so there are a lot of maps that come out of um, folks that I would think of as my colleagues um, that get treated like art in online anyway. So they, they sort of get exposed as art through, through social media and do the digital rounds. Um, so they're kind of in the digital gallery. Um, and that's, they, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't look the same if you printed them anyway. Um, so that's, there's a, there's a whole other gallery that, that exists out there that people don't, you know, it sort of exists on your mobile devices and your computer screens. That's where a lot of this stuff ends up when people really connect with it. It, it ends up there in front of this whole other audience. So. Right. I think this is a good place to stop. Uh, maybe there are some questions in the public? Yes. So uh, this is a work in progress, by the way. So it's not. It, it, this would have been. This Should is we repeat the question? Oh yeah, maybe. Right. I mean, you can repeat it as well. Uh, so uh, asking about the um, the the choice of, of framing materials here, and also the source of the data used to build the three D model. Um, so the source of the data is a digital elevation model, the same that I would have used for the terrains for these two um, images here. It's just a. Um, a raster image with elevations at every pixel. It's a very typical kind of geospatial piece of data for doing terrain renderings. 
Um, you can work with it in a couple of different pieces of software and turn it into a virtual 3D model so you can see it you know, as though it were a 3D model. Um, export it as a file type that a 3D printer can print, so then you get a little plastic model of it, and then you just need to box that up and pour rubber around it and make a mold out of it, and then take the mold out and fill it with cement. So it's a very straightforward, you know, it's a very, it's a, it's a from the, once the digital part is done, um, it, that's a very common sort of casting process that most um, artists and, and jewelers would be used to doing with wax. Um, so that's where the model comes from. I do the manipulation of the model while it's digital before it's printed in 3D, obviously, so that I can do the things where I was talking about compressing it. Um, and then the framing um, was done, so most of the, the models I've done like this, the model stands on its own. This, because I wanted it to resemble a landscape image in 3D, I needed to give it a frame, and I wanted the frame to be very big and bulky because I want to completely isolate this little piece of the landscape. And, and also has to stand up to this representation of these immense, you know, these are like 1,500 foot or plus cliffs. They're, they're giant and the piece is cement. It's got a lot of heft to it visually and in terms of what's, what it represents. So the framing was m I left full thickness for that, for that purpose to kind of compete with it. I agree. Um, yeah, I think I don't. I don't. Th I think it would be hard to dispute that it, it, it that it is and or isn't an art. It, it is um, where the argument in cartography kind of continues to roil on forever and ever is. What do we mean by art in cartography? And a lot of people have very different opinions of um, what that stands for. There's there's art in cartography means um, artistic rendering of maps, making things pretty and beautiful and, and having nice, beautiful flourishes of lines and, and, and ornamentation and that sort of thing. Um, I tend to think of art more as free thinking. It's a design. It, it mean, the art in cartography means that you, have, uh, uh, you don't have to follow rules, that you have free choice over, over the decision-making process of what you put in, take out, how you represent things. That's the art of cartography to me is in the decision-making of of the processes you undergo, things you leave in, things you put in um, and take out, uh, as opposed to just sort of the, the beautifulness of something. I think I'm the, the, in that sense, you can make a map that may not be that appealing to look at, but that is a significant design work and encompasses a lot of your skills as a craftsman, as a cartographer. And, and art, to me, represents that uh, people will sometimes call something an art or an artist because they have an unfathomable mastery of some craft, you're a watchmaker, or you're a boat builder, whatever. Um, you're an artisan, you're an artist, and, in, and it may not be that you have sort of these traditional creative skills, but you have a mastery of this craft that's hard for most other people to understand, and so it becomes an art in a sense. Um, but that's the problem with art and cartography. I think there's, a, there's many different little ways to sort of pick out how we each think about what we mean by art and cartography. Um, so I agree. So definitely art, and we probably all have a bunch of definitions of where that actually lies within within the discipline. I think, um, I mean, these are very interesting questions, uh, but because exactly art uh, stands sometimes for, like, as you were saying, mastery and also excellence, there's a lot of uh, um, anxieties in trying to put uh, some person's, like, favorite disciplines into the category of art. So we have, uh, you know, art now spans from uh, ballet to material culture, from, you know, performances, which are you know, evanescent and so on, to, you know, cartography. And also I would have no problem in including some uh, specimens of cartography into the, you know, the discipline of art. But for me, the most interesting question is like, why do we exclude certain things and why include certain orders? You know, what are the sort of like pressures, even emotional pressures that make, make us want 
something to be regarded as art or not, uh, right? And um, and that's in a certain way it's one of the core questions of art because art uh, makes of critical thinking and questioning uh, one of its core principles, uh, exactly because it's such a slippery term. So I think just asking the question itself is uh, like a good starting point, uh, and then uh, you know the conversation can lead in many different directions. Always put a north arrow and a scale bar on your map. <laughs> uh, you know, there. So when I was doing it, I, you, one of the one of the, cart, the you, your final project in a cartography class was to, I think, replicate another map. You'd have like a, a topographic map, and you'd you'd replicate it in great detail, um, in and and the focus was on on not on visual design, so things that I think about that are important in map making, visual hierarchy, balance, context, um, abstraction, generalization, things that help build the core of what goes in here that talks to you. Cartography, um, this is an older concept of, of what you would train as, was really focused on neatness of lines, um, um, construction of scale bars, scale accuracy, um, you know, neat lines. Um, I think you know you hear stories of people saying that you could do this like un you could make a, comp a perfect final project cartographic map. This is all hand done stuff back in the day. Um, and if you got a little smudge in the corner somewhere, they you you I, I fail you. I'm sure that wasn't true, but you'd get marked off heavily for sort of these imperfections of construction, which to me are don't mean anything in terms of you being a real cartographer or not. Um, this is all of cartography is all about. Um, ingesting the story, the information, and, f and defining a goal for the map, and, and then producing the map that satisfies that goal. Um, and uh, whether I smudged my paper or not, <laughs> I don't know. So that's the kind of stuff you would train as, is, is, uh, and I'm sure there's a lot more to it. Um, there are completely different programs for cartography now than the kinds that I think were available to me when I was an undergrad. Um, and there are there are some schools. Um, is it Madison, can't think of where it is now. Penn State and there's another university that have a couple of cartography departments that are um, geared more towards the stuff I'm talking about. And they what they want you to know is how to communicate with maps effectively, how to employ all these different aspects of design to make your map do what you need it to. And these the, the folks coming out of these programs are all ending up at places like National Geographic, the, um, the Washington Post, um, you know, New York Times, um, places where if you go look at what they're doing online, the digital maps they're producing are amazing in terms of um, map work. So a lot of them have, some of what we were talking about, the political maps of the United States earlier and, and how horrible the standard political map is. And then if you go look at what some of these other um, venues have done, they kind of come in after the fact and redo what the nightly news did is their horrible rendition of something that went on the map. Um, and you can, you can really see the difference between someone who's thoughtful and well-trained in design and communication with the map and what we kind of get as the public from the more traditional method of, of mapping. And those, so those people are coming out of those schools and they're dispersing out into the world and producing a lot of the more subtle map graphics that you probably see around every year now. Maybe one more question? Or maybe not. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks to David Medeiros and Emanuela Luli. Thank you. <clears throat> As David Rumsey puts our next set of slides on the screen. I will read the biographies of our next two. We're going to segue straight into our last series, or our last talk in the series. We have, uh, so delighted, we have Lisa Lefebvre. She is the inaugural executive director of Holt Smithson Foundation. Like Emily Kelsey, Lisa, was instrumental in our 
um, being able to bring in both the S Robert Smithson work, which is downstairs in the rotunda, and the Nancy Holt works, which are over here to the left. Um, I should say that it was Lisa's uh, curatorial contribution to suggest that we include the drawing, which David Rumsey and I didn't even know about. But she said this; she thought it would be great, and we were just so delighted. Um, so more about Lisa. She's a curator, writer, editor, and public speaker. Previously directed the Henry Moore Institute, the research component of the Henry Moore Foundation. She led the contemporary art program at the National Maritime Museum, taught on the postgraduate curatorial program at Goldsmiths College London, and was the course director of the postgraduate arts policy and management program at Burbeck College, University of London. She co-curated the Quinquennial Exhibition British Art Show 7 with Tom Morton and has served on numerous committees including the 2019 Arnaldo Pomodoro Sculpture Prize, 2018 Turner Prize, 2016 Hepworth Sculpture Prize and the 2015 British Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. Lisa will be interviewed by Jordan Stein whom you met before. I will go ahead and reintroduce him in case you missed it earlier. Jordan says, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Curator and writer of San Francisco, Jordan is a co-founder of the interdisciplinary collaborative group Will Brown, which realized over three dozen exhibitions and programs in their Mission District storefront from 2012 to 2015 before working parasitically with other organizations. <laughs> he founded Cushion Works, a just-in-time gallery on the second floor of an active cushion-making workshop in 2017. He has published on both Bruce Connor and, and Hippie Era classified ads. Upcoming projects include, stay tuned, flooding San Francisco City Hall with children's art and a book on Jay DeFeo and if you missed it, Jordan wrote the brilliant essay in our catalog for this exhibition, so make sure you pick up a copy. And Jordan was uh, very uh, helpful to David and myself in the making of this show, so thank you very much. And please welcome. We have many things that we want to say that we want to talk about, but having said that, from experience, at this point in any conference, everyone is a little bit sleepy. You've had your lunch, it's that combination, it's warm outside, it's cold here. So we're going to show some images behind us. We're not going to speak to them. They're really a backdrop because they're kind of more interesting than looking at us. Not that you're not interesting to, to look at. Um, and if anyone has got any specific questions, we, we can talk about them. But it's really something that is a, a visual stimulus as we start talking. And really, um, this is going to be a genuine conversation. We've got a sense of some things that, that we want to talk about. But I think uh, probably Salim um, said it in the most concise way. Uh, we both share a belief that maps are a catalyst for ideas. And really in the spirit of that, this section of today is thinking through ideas, not finding answers, raising a few questions. And I have to say that um, for us at Holt Smithson Foundation, we cannot think of anywhere we would prefer to see Nancy Holt and Robert Smithson represented and in this very particular company. Thank you for being here, Lisa. <laughs> I'm really excited. You're the closer. I know. It's kind of scary, uh, It's right? big. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to be in conversation. I'm also, as anyone who's, who has spent time waiting in, in uh, Holtian and Smithsonian waters knows that they c it can be quite, quite rugged. These are very serious, very amazing, very complicated seminal American figures. And, um, you know, so I've got, I've just got pages of scribbles 
And notes here, I got art forum articles from 1977 under me. I feel like I went back to graduate school, mm. um, which is a kick, and which was maybe the last time that I, that I read a lot of Robert Smithson. Mm. To the point you just made, I thought maybe we could, as a sort of preamble, mm. This is a little Smithson quote that I wanted to read before we talk about the works that are mm. here on view. He says in, in Mirror Travels in the Yucatan, which is really a seminal piece of writing from, uh, from many decades ago, he says, you must travel at random, mm. <laughs> maps. like the first Mayans, you risk getting lost in the thickets, but that is the only way to make art. Mm. So where are we? Uh, why, why is this a home for... Robert Smithson and Nancy Holt, and mm -hmm. has their work ever appeared in this sort of context before that's really largely about being found a little bit more than being lost? Wow, there's uh, probably three different questions, and I've got many, many res responses to them. Um, so why, why here? Why is this so significant? Um, both Nancy Holt and, Ro and Robert Smithson, their work, and you'll kind of get a sense of this as we're zooming through the, these images. I think TJ has got them on a five second lo loop or so, and they'll just come back if we, uh, if we keep on going with our, with our talking. For both Nancy Holt and Robert Smithson, they're very different artists. Both artists were born in 1938. And I would like to argue, and I would also say that although I'm director of this foundation, I was very happy arguing this before I took on this position, that really these are two artists who laid the grounds for art as we understand it today. These are artists who were interested in a sense of place. And for both artists, and I would say this is one of the key moments of where they, they have a shared sensibility, um, these artists were really interested in trying to think about how we find our place on this planet. Um, and one of the things which um, turns to our, our last panel um, that I think is so fundamental about art and maybe so fundamental about map making as well, um, I think we can all agree that being human is incredibly difficult. Finding our place on the planet is incredibly difficult. And perhaps the role of art is to make that even more difficult. So asking <laughs> sets uh, of questions. And um, just in case any, anyone doesn't know, the reason why these two artists are, are paired in this foundation um, is because these are, are two artists who had in an incredibly rich dialogue um, that probably started around 1956 or so. These artists um, were a married couple. Um, that's not really that, that relevant, but it explains why they are, are brought together. R uh, both artists were born in 1938. Robert Smithson passed away um, in um, an airplane accident in 1973, and Nancy Holt passed away in 2014. And Nancy Holt really made it um, her task to get people to know about Robert Smithson's work. So this is really why they're so interwoven. Um, both artists were interested in thinking about this complexity of art, and both artists were committed to thinking about art as being an intellectual discourse, not necessarily being an object, not necessarily situating it within the walls of a, a gallery. So you've probably seen uh, the photograph that Emily and David chose by Nancy Holt, that's over <coughs> in that case there. This is one um, photograph of a landmark work she made between 1973 and 1976 called Sun Tunnels that's out in the Great Basin Desert. Um, so this is an earthwork. It's an artwork that unless you live out in uh, the small town of Lucin that has a population of five people, is a long way away. Um, and I'm giving that caveat because often when earthworks are talked about, they're talked about in terms of being remote artworks. And I always want to put up a flag and say, remote to who? If you live in Lucin, it's 10 minutes walk. Um, it's just that there's not many people that are there. So what does it mean when artworks are outside of major centers for, for art? How do we know about them? They become mobile. They become mobile through photography, ph photography through film, 
through drawings, through rumor, through conversations, through writing. And that wonderful quote that you just read from the text by Robert Smithson, it's about a journey that he took in 1969 to the Yucatan in Mexico. And the work is the journey, the text, the conversation, and the traces. And when I first arrived this morning, and I have to admit, I've been so looking forward to coming here to, to this place, I was excitedly looking at all of the, the objects and, and talking to Emily and David. And I picked up on this amazing globe that I understand is on permanent display. And I realized that it folds down like an umbrella. And there's a case there, so like an umbrella, you can carry it around. And since learning this from David and Emily, my mind has been doing somersaults because it really strikes me that when it comes to thinking about artwork that is outside of the museum and the gallery, the art centers, it's about making place mobile. And perhaps that's part of the, the beauty of maps. It makes an elsewhere come here. And in that journey, it's all about mobility. So maybe that brings me to the next re response to, to, to your question, is if we're going out to the Great Basin Desert, um, not only is, let's imagine, we don't live in Lucid, um, it's a long way away. You've also got to get there. How do you get there? Well, you have a map. And that sense of location being so important to these two artists. Um, and both artists were, um, well, they weren't both born, but both artists grew up in New Jersey, that background place that we've already uh, heard, heard talked about. The New um, Rome. The New Rome, <laughs> yes, the eternal city. Um, with the uh, Robert Smithson object that's downstairs, this is a map of New Jersey. So I always wonder, what does it mean when you look to a map of where you're from? Surely you know where you're from but you don't know where you're from because you can't see it in the way that it can be represented on the two-dimensional plane. So I, I'm aware it's a very long answer to, to your question, but, but why here? It's because maps are fundamental to the work of Holt and Smithson in very different ways. And let's, let's go back out to the desert and to Nancy's work, and mm -hmm. I feel like in, in my studies and thinkings and readings, Smithson is generally privileged over her for, for perhaps a, a variety of reasons, not that we I necessarily. I think it's just for the one reason. <laughs> uh, well, we know for it, one, and one big old times reason. have changed. <laughs> right. So Nancy yeah. Holt, mm -hmm. can you tell the gang a little bit about Sun Tunnels and just mm. what it is and, mm. and why it's there and how the work came to exist and it, mm. it's maybe its current mm -hmm. condition and how it's mm. cared for and this mm. sort of thing? Um, well, like anything to do with a map, and a place, there's a story attached to it. And I think this is one of my big things that I think in every single presentation, I've been thinking through that a map is a means to initiate a story, or as Salim says, a, a catalyst for, for something. Um, so Nancy Holt, the very first time she traveled out to the desert was in 1968. And she traveled with Robert Smithson and with the artist Michael Heiser. And she describes that she's never been to the desert before, and she went to Nevada. And in her writing, she says it was quite close to Las Vegas, which I guess in 1968, Las Vegas was quite different as it is, is now. Um, and she describes that she just could not believe what she saw, what she perceived. She had no sense about how to orientate herself in that space. So Holt was born in Massachusetts, grew up in New Jersey, moved to New York. Um, suddenly, it was this expanse. Um, and she describes that she couldn't sleep for three nights. She kept on thinking, how can I orientate myself? She kept on thinking and thinking and realizing that in order to orientate oneself, you need to have some frame for looking. Um, so a few years later in 1973, she started thinking about what would be a useful tool, a useful gesture, a useful object to think about perception in such a space. Um, 
And she was really interested in finding a site where there would be a basin that would be surrounded by a range. Um, and she eventually came across uh, this site in Utah, where very practically the land was cheap because it had no fertility to grow anything. It was, it was nothing land. So out of all of the land artists, Nancy Holt, um, as far as I know, I could be wrong, is the only artist who literally purchased the work herself for not a lot of money. She purchased 48, 40 acres in the Great Basin Desert, and she bought in four tunnels, four tunnels that are 18 feet long, um, and four tunnels that are set out in a cross formation. Um, and she, they're kind of like tunnels that you might see if you were trying to go through a hill, perhaps. But they were custom made. Um, she financed the project 73% um, herself. Um, the rest was from a grant from the NEA. Um, and she situated these four concrete cylinders in the middle of a basin. Each concrete cylinder is perforated with a representation of four different constellations. And the map drawing that we have on display here is of one of these constellations. And she picked these four constellations um, in terms of the brightness of them. And Nancy Holt was very interested in thinking about not only mapping the Earth on which we stand, but also the skies above us. Um, and she was very interested in thinking about bringing the stars down to Earth. Imagine walking on the stars. I mean, wh what a wonderful idea. And this is what sun tunnels do. They're perforated, and at nighttime, if it's a bright light, and there's, no, there's really no light pollution out there, the moonlight and the starlight comes through. In the middle of a hot, and it gets so hot out there, a hot sunny day, the sunlight comes through into the cool respite from the heat of these sun tunnels. Um, and twice a year, at the winter and summer solstices, these four tunnels arranged in an X exactly align with the winter and summer solstices. So for Nancy Holt, these were viewing devices, viewing devices to watch the movement of the sun which is why the pairing that David and Emily have made is just so perfect for, for Nancy Holt. And Holt often um, railed against trying to be packaged into a particular kind of artist. So she hated the term land art, which is what she made, but it's an artist's right to rail against things. She always said that if she had to be categorized, she would want to be called a perception artist. Because for her, the act of perception is the means through which we can find our place in the world. Beautiful answer. I want to read um, a couple of Nancy's quotes to that effect. She's talking about the inside of one of the sun tunnels. She says, the center of the work becomes the center of the world, mm -hmm. which is so economical and beautiful. She also says, I feel the need to look at the sky and the moon and the stars is very basic inside all of us. So when I say my work is an exteriorization of my own inner reality, I mean I'm giving back to people through art what they already have inside them. Mm -hmm. I mean, how amazing is that? Um, but I think that that really is what perception is. We are all perceiving machines. We are all fallible beings. Um, and perhaps that's really what this sense um, of perceiving and stopping and looking enables us to do. So thinking about um, the, the very act of looking at a map, what are we trying to do? We're trying to find our place. Um, and um, to my, my shame, I never knew of that Onkawara piece um, that's on display here. I mean, that's just a, w a wonderful piece that he's mapping himself, sometimes not leaving his house, sometimes going beyond the limits of, of the map. So that sense of the time of maps. And when we had the really lovely um, pop-up book display earlier, 
David, you were responding to, to a question about this temporality of maps. I think that's also what Nancy Holt is really interested in. Um, but I really like it that you pulled out that, that quote, the, the Robert Smithson item downstairs, and I'll say in a moment why I keep on saying item and object and, and not artwork. Um, it's a map, as I said before, it's of New Jersey. Um, it's cut intersections. Um, and it's an item that almost looks like, um, for a, a non-geographer, a non-cartographer, non-map scholar like myself, um, it, lo it looks like it's a pole. And Robert Smithson um, said, and in fact I came across this, this writing by him just th this week, he said that at the poles, all visual senses of place or sight become absolute. So I don't know if a cartographer or a geographer would, would agree with that, but for Smithson, it's this sense of a finite point to radi out, radiate out from. For him, the pole is New Jersey, um, the place where he is from, the background, the eternal city. Um, and the reason why I'm being slightly um, slippery about the item that, that's on, on display it's not only um, is it great to see Smithson work in this context, the item downstairs has never been shown in public before. Um, it's something that's part of Holt Smithson Foundation's collection. We don't really know what it is. So Smithson passed away, as I said before, in 1973. He was born in 1938. He had no idea that his time was going to be cut short. Um, he was experimenting with maps. So in fact, that object, it's been lurking in an envelope for many, many years in a drawer, and no one's pulled it out. Um, so I was uh, brought on to invent a terrifying prospect, um, th this foundation, about a year ago. And because I have fresh eyes, I could look at this thing and work out what it was. If you look very carefully at it, you can see that Smithson has drawn concentric lines on the map. And immediately, it was clear how it would fit together. So that sense of maps are puzzles. Uh, they enable us to puzzle through our place. And they also enable us to develop um, a relative relationship with place, with sight, um, with where we've been, with where we may be, immediately that draws in senses of, of time, approximation, testing. Right. Related to, to all that, I'm thinking about his relationship with language, which is really extraordinary. He's really an inventor mm. of language, and at the same time he's trying to create a vocabulary to talk about new and big ideas that are simultaneously ancient and future <laughs> ideas. Um, He's also challenging anything that's, that's sort of come across his desk. And he writes, I like this is sort of a call and response. I'm just going to keep <laughs> feeding you quotes. He's talking about um, traveling through, through Mexico and, and, and reckoning with the map that you have if you're driving through Mexico in 1969. And he says, looking down at the map, it was all there, a tangled network of horizon lines on paper called, quote, roads little bl blue threads called rivers. And there are all sorts of color-coded points of interest on the map where you can buy crafts and where there was a temple and things. And he says, on the map of Mexico, they were scattered like the droppings of some small animal. So maps are totally fundamental to the practice, but at the same time, points out not only the arbitrary nature of maps, but the arbitrary nature of any sort of symbology, any kind of inherited sign that we are to understand in a particular way. I, I think that, that's com completely true. Um, and um, I mentioned before that Holt and Smithson are very, very different artists. Uh, I would say that Nancy Holt is an artist who's really concerned with, with perception, whereas Smithson is concerned with um, acts of cognition. How do we try and make sense of our place in the world by inventing symbol? How do we try and make a truth from the impossibility of what it is to, 
to, to be human. So in her very kind in introduction, um, Emily said um, that I used to work at the National Maritime Museum in, in London. Um, and I have to say, um, as it's just between us, that's probably my favorite job that, that I've, I've ever had. Um, and I learned so much when I was working there. It was um, a very experimental idea to invite contemporary artists to make very significant exhibitions at this museum. But it was also a very pragmatic move. Uh, the museum had a whole floor that did not have adequate um, climate controls for showing maps or showing the precious objects. So they thought, oh, we'll just give it to some artists and they can do some, some things with it. Um, and what I learned very quickly being at this museum, um, and when I was there, its uh, mission statement was to explore um, the stars, the seas, the land, time, and their relationship to people. I mean, that is just the, the gift of a line. It's since been, it's now outdated. There's another, another thing that, that's used. But what I love about that is it does two things. Firstly, these are all imponderables. So we invent maps. We invent time um, because it makes everything easier. And then I also feel that um, maps and that particular museum and, and also this place that, that we're in um, are the most political sites that you can possibly have. And I should probably qualify that. Um, and I'll, I'll use someone else's words who's far more erudite than I could, I could ever be. Um, the philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy makes this amazing differentiation between the political and politics. So he says the political is where people come together, they argue, they don't agree, they storm off, uh, they share ideas. It's always a place full of electricity and ideas, whereas politics is the administration of the political. And where art resides, I don't think is in the administration, I think it's in the political. And perhaps that's where maps reside too in the political. It's a place of um, speculation based in fact. It's a place of trying things out. It's a place that's always waiting to be revised by someone else. And perhaps that slipperiness, that nice word that was used in, in the last discussion, that is what's so important when we're thinking about, I'm going to use this phrase again, sorry if I'm being um, repeating myself, but that slipperiness is why trying to find our place in the world is all we can do. There's, there's nothing more we could possibly try. Mm. More specifically, and regarding politics and the political, a lot of land art has, has long been considered somewhat apolitical. There's some land out there, mm -hmm. artists get their hands on it, dig a big trench, and it's, it's an exercise of some God-given uh, right to make a big thing far away from a museum. Yeah. Times have changed as they always do. How does the foundation, how does it come to think in terms more explicitly of, of politics or the political or, or the actions that not just Robert and Nancy took but, but many of their colleagues, I guess, and associates? Or how, how relevant is that question to the, to the mission moving yeah. forward? I, I think it's, it's a really relevant question. Um, 2019, obviously, is not 1973. Um, things, things have changed um, very, very significantly. And um, in this foundation that we're literally, it's just over a year old, we're literally growing in, into being, um, one very important principle is that um, the artists are no longer here, so our job is to speak for them. But we do not try and, I don't know, inhabit their minds, because that's impossible. Our job is to come up with decisions that are right for the artwork. Um, and there are discourses, dialogues, questions that we must ask today. So as an example of this, um, at the moment I'm just in the middle. In fact, it's going to be my task to copy edit it on my journey home later to today. I'm writing a foreword for a book um, that really tears to pieces 
spiral jetty and sun tunnels because the artists take no um, note in any shape or form um, to um, the Native Americans whose land it was. It's just not noticed at all by these artists. Um, there's no allusions to it. So in 2019, that is an untenable position. So it's essential to bring in those discourses and say, well, what does it mean? Um, is, um, and I hope this isn't the case, but the question ne needs to be asked, is this um, genre, for want of a better word, of land art, is it some kind of colonialism on other people's lands? Well, yes, but what does that mean? So that sense of thinking about what these earthworks do is really, really important because after all, perhaps, Part of the purpose of art is to raise questions. It's not to find solutions. And the ground of those questions are going to be constantly changing um, in order to stimulate new, new thought. And do you feel it's the role of the foundation to um, articulate those questions, find thinking partners, or is it sort of more like this the Felix Gonzalez Felix Gonzalez Torres Foundation that's really a, um, a negotiator? Mm -hmm. um, a reactor, a mm -hmm. facilitator. How do you think about that sort of thing? Yeah, I, th I think it's both, actually. Uh, the Felix Gonzalez Torres Foundation is, I think, a, a really fundamental model for how an artist foundation can operate because it's not there to say we are in control. It's about facilitating discourse and enabling the artwork to live long into the future. Our foundation, in order to enable Nancy Holt and Robert Smithson's work to live into the future, we have to, and I'm now going to steal that perfect phrase from you, we need to find thinking partners. And those thinking partners are not always in the traditional places. So as an example of this, we, um, we're a foundation um, that is just going to live for 20 years, will terminate in 2038, <laughs> which is 100 years after both of the artists were, were born, we're at the moment uh, planning out what we're going to do for 20 years. Um, and we're in the early stages of creating an online research hub. We, we are commissioning uh, short texts by scholars and thinkers from every possible uh, discipline, so not just art, art historians. So that keeping things alive That's is That's so essential. fascinating. I didn't realize that. I mean, that really speaks to... Smithson's idea of these sort of mirror displacements. I don't know if the gang knows them, but you know, he went to the Yucatan to place mirrors in opposition to one another. When you look at this landscape of these sort of square mirrors laid out, they reflect endlessly off one another so that the field is anything but fixed. You can't, in other words, quantify the color of the sky that's reflected in one of the mirrors at that particular second. Um, so the notion that you would actively position sort of reflecting mirrors for 20 years or something is kind of poetical and, and, and tropic in a strange way. Mm. And, and it comes from the artist's work as, yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have another minute or two. Mm -hmm. Back to Nancy Holt for a second, just because I'm so curious to know this. Maybe other folks are too. She initiated a body of work called Buried Poem, Buried mm. Poems. And I'm going to read something that she, she wrote about it, and I just don't know much about it, so taking this opportunity. Each buried poem, as she calls it, was made for a specific person who received a booklet containing maps, descriptions, and or history of the site, and detailed directions for retrieving the poem, which was buried in a vacuum container. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about that gorgeous well, project? Well, I, I can and I can't, because that's it's fundamental to the work itself. So the buried poems, um, Nancy Holt made uh, five in total, um, and one she didn't get round to finishing. Um, they were private artworks. So if I was Nancy Holt and I wanted to make a buried poem for you, I would think to myself, okay, what are the characteristics of this human being? Is there a location somewhere on this planet that reminds me of you? And then I would gather together uh, maps, photographs, data on that particular site, um, and then I would put them in this vacuum flask. I would bury it, and I would give you instructions. 
It's very interesting that the um, the Berry poems that they all still I exist. One was um, a private one to Robert Smithson uh, that was made in Dartmoor in England, and Nancy Holt specifically, very very specifically, underlined it was private. No one else sees it. Um, she made one for the poet and writer John Perrault um, that she didn't give those instructions for, but he always said it was mine and it was private. I don't want to share it. So what does that mean for a map when a map is private? It makes me think of being a child and playing treasure maps with my, my cousin. Um, that sense of maps are not just universal, national, local, regional. They can be between two people, and perhaps we all have them. Friendship maps, romantic maps, we don't call them that, but we go to a site and remember a person for it. Um, and I think that really links to Nancy Holt's interest in graveyards in the west of the United States that, of course, is echoed in the great work right at the back over where TJ is, is sitting. Great. Okay, I think we're going to take some, some questions. I can't help myself from just reading one more Smithson quote just to, s to see as if they're not seated already, but related to what you just said. He, um, it is the dimension of absence that remains to be found. I can just say that that particular quotation relates to um, the hunting of the snark that was a, a favorite um, of Smithson. Should I repeat the question? McIntyre asks, who's, who's writing this book that Lisa uh, mentions that take, that's taking the work uh, to task, so to speak? Well, it's really great, actually. It's being published by a group of three um, artists, and it's, it's not really being published by a big publisher. It's being published by the Finnish Cultural Institute in New York City, um, and it's a group of artists who've just come together actually to talk about the conservation of earthworks. And one pair of artists who co-wrote a text went down this route. Um, so it's actually quite unusual that we would want to write a forward for, for something that is probably won't circulate amongst many, many people. But we want to underline this is a discourse that we want to have um, because, it, because it's so important. And I talked about this um, online research hub We've invited the authors of this text to develop what they've written in this book, to do something for, for this website. Um, and it's something that down the road, um, we've put as a priority that we want to look at in terms of publishing around Holt and Smithson. And, and I, th I think part of the, uh, the wonderful thing about, about maps is that maps can allow you to go somewhere that no longer exists. Um, and I remember when I w was working at the National Maritime Museum, I used to do this thing that I'm sure was completely not, not allowed, but I was work would always work very late into the evening. And usually my last hour, which I would say between 9 and 10, I would go into the map stores and just look at these places that I could travel to that no longer exist. And perhaps this sense of, um, 
Earthworks land art in the 1970s and 1980s, in a way, it's not that long ago, but it's also so long ago. And we're traveling back to a different set of values and observances um, that is um, changing. And that, that shift is where this realm of the political really re resides. The tension between breaking rules and inventing new modes and methods. And, and I think in a way that's what um, Robert Smithson did by starting in New Jersey for so much of his work. New Jersey, this overlooked place, I'm going to be thinking again and again about it just being the place where the index for the map goes. That's where he <laughs> turned his, his uh, attention. And the there's a, a quotation that has been running around my mind for much of today from um, the historian of science, Karl Popper, who I always think I need to read a lot more of. And he talks a lot about pushing beyond the limits of known horizons. Perhaps that's really part of what artistic practice is about doing or recalibrating them. But in order to push beyond the known horizons, you need to know what the known horizons are. So that's where this temporality, this, this movement, really comes, comes to find its, its place. Abby. So, I, um, you, see you were drawing a distinction between Holt's um, understanding of perception as a way of knowledge versus cognition as a way of significant way of understanding where we are in the world. And I'm not sure I understand why perception and cognition are not the same? Can't they it's a really great point. I mean, I think they are one of the same, but perhaps they're different, um, they're different weights. So the way that Holt really wanted to, a, a good way of describing how Nancy Holt really liked to work is if ever she went out for lunch with someone, she would spend a lot of time fussing about where people would sit. And it was all about ensuring that the person with her had the best place to sit so they could stop and look and think. Smithson, on the other hand, wouldn't even give you time to sit down. He'd be too busy throwing books at you, giving you, you facts. This different way of um, establishing approach to this sense of, of locate, locatedness. Um, and I think that um, it's a distinction that really only needs to be made because um, I'm very wary, and we at Holt Smithson Foundation are very wary of these two artists becoming one. They were different. <coughs> um, it just so happens that they chose to share a certain portion of their life together and it was cut short and that's why this foundation is named after these two artists so it's really I think a, a sense of saying shared sensibilities with different methods um, yeah time for one more Mr. David Rowe. How, how do you deal with at the foundation with the conservation of the work or do you not We've been seeing pictures of these massive excavations that they, that they by now we know have gone through changes of weather and time and so on. Do you just let that happen in those cases? I'll uh, just repeat the question for those in the, okay. in the back, which is um, how does the foundation uh, think about and deal with conservation for these works, many of which are out of nature, remote, remote places? Do you just let it happen? A combination of both, really. 
Um, so in terms of the, the pragmatics, because this foundation, we have decided, has got this very, very short life, um, we are passing the responsibility on to others. Um, so for example, Sun Tunnels, we enabled Dear Art Foundation to acquire last year to steward. Um, they already steward um, a very important work by Robert Smithson uh, called Spiral Jetty. How, how do we think about conservation? We think that it's never about making sure that these artworks look exactly as they did when they came out of the oven. Um, so that for us is not right because if it is the case that these artists are concerned with how we find our place in the world, that change is really, really important. And I often think that, um, I, I often find it really useful in thinking through questions by thinking about what it is to be human because it's what we know better than, than anything else. We all know that as a human being, we change over time. Um, and there's lots of things we can do. We can just let it go as it goes. We can maybe stop eating cookies for breakfast um, and you know endure a little bit longer. Or we can take um, medical intervention to change the way we appear over time. It's the same with an artwork. Um, and for us, we go the not eating cookies for breakfast roots. Um, we'll never radically change the, the work. We want it to change over time because that's part of the marvelousness of it. Um, but if, um, and in, in fact in, in a month's time, Sun Tunnels is undergoing um, some really significant restoration, the restoration will make sure that um, some animals that are burrowing underneath Sun Tunnels, that they no longer burrow anymore, we'll basically move them to a new home. Sun tunnels, um, because of its remote location and because of the peculiarities and particularities of, of that location, a lot of people, um, and as a British person, I, I've only been in the US for, for a year, this confuses me a lot, um, a lot of people have guns, um, <laughs> and um, it's great fun, by all accounts, to shoot bullets in sun tunnels, and you get these black lines, we're not going to get rid of them because Nancy Holt liked them and they're just part of what it is to be out there. I'm fascinated by the fact that every single road sign on the route to sun tunnels is covered with bullet holes. So we'll keep it as it is, um, but we won't um, make them perfectly clean as if there'd be no rain. And the same with Spiral Jetty which is a work that's in the Great Salt Lake. It's impacted by climate, and we want it to change. For many years, it was invisible under the Great Salt Lake. You can see it now. And at some point, maybe it will be under the water again. We don't think it should be built up again, um, but we actively discourage people from taking stones and, and so on um, just to keep it there. In, in nature. But like anything um, to do with these two artists and, and many artists of this generation, now is the time where we're just thinking through the long future of these, these artworks and where we're making it up as we go along. Thank you so much, Lisa. Terrific. Join me, Salim. Yes, so I get my notebook. So it's an opportunity now, um, Jordan. If you want to uh, wrap up the the day, so to speak, this is the time, and then I'll join you. You'll join me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> what well, kind of? I tip my hand because I like, other, I like what other people have to say, as you could tell. <laughs> so um, over the course of the day, I just wrote down a lot of things that people said, and I didn't want to try to put it together. And I didn't really have this idea before I sat down here today, but um, David said something right when we got started, which was 
the pairings work in constellations. And I thought it was great. So I wrote it down, and I thought, well, what if I just write down a whole bunch of other stuff that people said, and maybe it can work in constellations, and I can now try to fix those constellations? Because I think that's what maybe art tries to do. So I'm going to read. I'm going to read this. <laughs> Your experience will undoubtedly be different than mine. How thinking about space has changed over centuries. Harvard got rid of its geography department. <laughs> it makes this imaginary thing real. How can borders be easily disassembled? Where do you spend money? A vision of state propaganda. What are the aims and agendas of this map maker? We wanted to present a cartographic lie that told the truth. Virtually everything in the city is named for a man. Sofas on the streets of LA. The non-map heads in the room. <laughs> a good piece of writing implies a map. Untitled spaghetti. It couldn't be on the floor. The kids were part of the work. He wants his art to be a virus within museums. What's the exact paper size I should use? <laughs> Identity is made of public and private events. Here we have the corresponding maps in Mandarin. Do you ever say no to requests? <laughs> I find ways to use tools beyond their intended goals. I'm trying to take the map away from the map. 50 pages of sex positions. <laughs> <laughs> what is this table made of? Why do we include certain things and exclude others? I can't. I can't top that, so. Um, I, I wanted to uh, actually take this opportunity uh, as we wrap up the day. Um, uh, yes, the, the day is ending, but the exhibition in many ways has just begun. Uh, we will, uh, the exhibition will stay on till uh, end of September. So um, that's just something uh, to think about as you decide to come back and have a, have a, have a closer look, if you can get to all of it today. Um, but really, I want to take this opportunity uh, to say thanks to many people uh, that made today and the exhibition um, till the end of September uh, possible. Um, first, uh, David and Abby Rumsey for their immense generosity and support. A round of applause. Uh, the curators, Emily Prince, and once again, David Rumsey. Uh, and of course, uh, today's speakers. Thank you all for coming today. And thank you for an amazing, amazing show. Uh, a few others. Deirdre uh, uh, Fsell for installing the bulk of the exhibition. She's over here. Uh, TJ Crisada is way at the back over there. He did logistics, purchases, receiving, receiving works, uh, endless list. So thank you, TJ. Um, also, Bryn Kramer, Anna Christ, Bryn's over there, Anna, is you here? Oh, she must have left already. Uh, Jake Zawlaki, he's back there. Thank you, thank you for your help. Um, lastly, uh, two individuals outside the regular orbit of the centers and, and their staff, uh, Kristen St. John for conservation, for con uh, from conservation for cons uh, condition reporting, advice on installation. Um, uh, I don't think she's here. Um, and then uh, Becky Fishbach, uh, who was, was back there, actually, uh, lent us both her studio and her expertise to us. Thank you, Becky. And <laughs> yeah, so a long list. I obviously haven't, uh, 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 I, there are a couple other people, actually. <laughs> I'll keep going. <laughs> Julie Sweet, kind singer, sitting right here in front of us. Bob Schwartzwalder, way at the back. <laughs> thank you, thank you both. 
Um, I just want to leave with some announcements. Um, I, I want to say the, the exhibition will remain until the end of September, um, available for viewing. We are open one to five Monday through Friday. Uh, we do close for classes. Uh, so, uh, you know, check our website, ramzimapcenter.stanford.edu before coming. Um, and then um, uh, Center will be open today until until six. Uh, but of course, now we invite you uh, downstairs for reception. It begins right now. Uh, go downstairs, have some have some food, check out more of the exhibit. Thank you for coming, and do return. Uh -huh.